Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, the next person that I want to open her mic is Dr. Diane Thompson. So if you have friends that they're texting you to say that they can't get on, tell them to watch us on Facebook Live. That's the whole idea. They can watch us live on Facebook. So Dr. Diane, uh, please open your mic. Dr. Diane Thompson, let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, doctor, she's triple board certified. Uh, she's a triple board certified physician. She's chief of the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and medical director of rehabilitation unit in New York hospital system. She's an assistant professor at Cornell and Columbia. She is an Amazon best selling author and she, the, one of the certification that she holds where you're going to learn to love her, love her, love her is in lifestyle medicine. Dr. Diane, welcome. I sound like I'm shouting because, because I'm excited. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Well, first of all, can you hear me well? Lorna? We can hear you where I'm Absolutely. there. Okay. All right, yeah. all right. So first of all, Richard, that was so awesome. Beautiful, beautiful. And hello to everyone, welcome. Lorna, I have to say a very special thank you to you for doing this. And as I go on in my talk, I look at this as your water to the forest fire. It will make sense later, right? I, I really appreciate you doing this. So as Lorna mentioned, my name is Dr. Diane Thompson. My board certification is in physical medicine and rehabilitation, brain injury medicine, and my passion which is lifestyle medicine, because I really believe that this is the way to help people attain their best health and their best life. I'm gonna share this story with you. This is a story that I heard many years ago by Bongari. She was a Kenyan activist and a Nobel Prize winner. She has since passed on and you may have heard this story before. I've heard it in different ways, but she was the first one who shared it with me. And it really has shaped the way I approach my life. As she told the story, the forest is on fire. The forest is on fire. There's a forest fire. It is raging. There is smoke everywhere. It is hot. There is destruction and all the animals, they run to the edge of the forest and they're looking on as this forest is burning. And they really feel as though there's nothing they can do. They're paralyzed into inaction. They stand there and watch this going down. And this little hummingbird just flew by them, went to the nearest stream, picked up one drop of water, flew back, dropped it on this big raging fire. Flew back to the stream, picked up that drop of water, flew back, dropped it on this big raging fire. And the other animals, the elephants with the large trunk that can carry a lot of water, the tigers, the lions, all the other animals stand there transfixed, paralyzed and watching this little hummingbird going back and forth. And they said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the hummingbird said, I'm trying to put out the fire. And they said, you are too small. This fire is too big. You are small and insignificant. You are wasting your time. And the hummingbird said, I'm going to do the best that I can. And I think that is what the universe asks of us all to do, is to do the best that we can. And for me, lifestyle medicine has been my water to that fire. Because as I've learned over the years of chronic diseases, lifestyle related diseases that have been taking people out, many of those people look like me. And we know that if we can get people to make a few changes in their lives, we can make a large impact. Another thing I wanna share with you is because it seems there's a fire going on around us, aside from health. Many of you, no matter where you are, have been impacted by coronavirus. I live in New York City, the epicenter, 
And because I'm a physician, I had to go in every day when others were on lockdown at home. And as it turned out, I also contracted coronavirus and had to stay home to nurse myself. But while I was going to work, I remember because I'm in physician leadership, every day I would be on the phone. And because by then we had stopped meeting as a group because we were afraid of infecting each other. And so we would have these virtual meetings and you would hear these deaths day after day. The numbers were just unimaginable. And I recognized every morning that I had to pick up the phone to listen to these numbers that these were people's mothers and sisters and husbands and wives and friends. And it was devastating. It felt like the, the forest was again on fire and it felt so big, so large. And I remember when I did get sick and I had to stay home and I had fever, chills, rigor. I was very debilitated. I was in bed for days. I had a headache that I couldn't seem to get rid of. I was always so tired. I had no appetite and I was wrapped up in bed all the time. And with this, your circadian rhythm gets messed up because you're sleeping all day and then you're up at night and you're thinking about the enormity of it. And it's tempting to get paralyzed. And every so often when that happened and I felt like, man, this is so big. So many people are dying. I remember leaving work and seeing the refrigerated trucks because it had bodies. And I'm like, this is too much. But then I took myself back to this hummingbird story. And I decided that when I got well, I was going to continue the pledge that I had made to myself years ago to continue teaching lifestyle medicine, to continue bringing drop by drop of water to that forest. I actually went back to medical school when I was 37. I was 37 when I was a first year medical student. For a decade and a half, I was actually a registered nurse. I was a registered nurse, then a nurse practitioner, a nursing professor. The truth is I wanted to be a doctor when I was a little girl in Jamaica. I was growing up in the ghetto area of Jamaica and I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor because as a child I had asthma. And if you ever had asthma where you are reaching for breath and as a child you don't quite understand what's happening, this is the most vulnerable you'll ever feel. And my mom would take me to the pediatrician. I didn't understand what they did, but I just knew I felt better. And I committed myself that when I grew up, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be able to help people when they were mo at their most vulnerable. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to be a doctor. But as many of us know, when you come to this country as an immigrant, things don't always play out as you think they should. And so things were very tough at the beginning. And I couldn't see myself um, becoming a doctor, working full time and going to medical school. I could do it as a nurse. And so I decided to become a nurse. But as time went on, I was worried. I felt like I wanted to do this other thing and life should not be lived with regrets. My own father had died. He had died an early death um, from chronic disease. And he had died with most of his dreams not realized. And I didn't want that for myself. So at 37, I went back to medical school. I packed it up, left my wonderful job. Everybody thought I was crazy. And I packed up my car and drove multiple states over and decided to go back to medical school. I went to school at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And Baltimore is a great place to learn medicine. It is not a great place to live if you are someone who's poor and of color living in certain neighborhoods in Baltimore. Baltimore has one of the highest rates of deaths, of many diseases. And that's why I said it's a good place to learn medicine because it's kind of unfortunate that I have to say that, but that's how you learn things that you will never see elsewhere. But for those people, Things you see in Baltimore is really shocking. I remember sitting in my medical school class. The professor was giving a lecture. He was giving the statistics about different diseases. And he just listed them all off. 
the diseases, the, the drug use, the death by murder. He was listing them off. And what I recognized as he was saying that I was in a class where over a hundred of us uh, were there. There were only about 10% of people of color. So we were the minority in the group. And as he talked about all those diseases, I realized that they affected people of color in a much higher proportion than anybody else. I remember sitting in the auditorium and I sunk in my seat. Make it for us. Um, just a minute, uh, Dr. Diane. If you're just joining us, please mute your mics. Everybody mute your mic except for Dr. Diane. You're breathing over. And I know she just has a few more minutes before our next speaker. So I certainly want everybody to hear what she has to say because uh, she has just a few more minutes. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, so as I sunk in my seat, I felt once again that the forest was on fire. And I recommitted myself that I would share these information that I could to help people even though it seems so enormous. So the last thing I will share with you is this. Dan Butner took a look at these group of people in the world. These were called longevity hotspots. We call them the blue zones. There are five areas in the world where people live long, healthy lives. I'm talking about in their 90s, 100-year-olds with no chronic diseases, if they do have very little. Dementia is something that is very rare. And when we say 90-year-olds, they're not in beds. These are 90-year-olds that are tending their homes. They're doing things that you and I are doing in our 40s. And we couldn't understand what was it that they were doing that the rest of us didn't know about. The blue zones are Ikaria, Greece, Okinawa, Japan. There is a Providence in, in Sard uh, called Sardinia in Italy. There's a seven day Adventist community. That's the only one here in Loma Linda in California. And there's also in Costa Rica on the Nicoya Peninsula. And there are a few things that you share, the tenants that we share in lifestyle medicine. And I just wanted to share a few of them with you today. And the idea is, just one drop by drop, you can change your health. So what he found was something we know, food is medicine. Food is medicine. If no one ever told you that, I'm telling you that today. We understand that food can harm you or it can help you. You get to choose. The foods that these groups of people ate that seemed to help were mostly plant-based, were lots of beans, tubers, seeds and nuts. If they had meat or fish, it was a rare occasion. The other thing that they found was movement is medicine. They didn't have gyms, but what they do is, see, we have modern conveniences. We jump in our cars. These people walk, they garden. They understood that if they wanted to stay healthy and stay alive for long, they need to keep themselves active. And they were committed to that. And so movement is medicine. The other thing that they figured out was loneliness can kill you. The studies show, by the way, that loneliness can take about eight years off your life. It's actually as bad as smoking. So they actually formed groups, these different communities in different countries where they met up, much like we're even doing today on Zoom. Thank you again, Lorna. They met up on a daily basis and interacted with each other because they understood the importance of socializing, of encouraging each other. They made sure to maximize their rest, restful, deep sleep. We actually look at brain of people on functional MRI, the brains of people who are chronically sleep deprived. It is as atrophied as someone who has dementia. We know this. We've known this for a long time. So making sure you're getting restful sleep and minimizing your stress level. And we see, unfortunately, people who are living with chronic stress, there is a soup of hormone that you live in. Cortisol is releasing constantly, affects your brain. Also atrophy affects the heart, cardiovascular disease. So minimizing your stress and finding ways to deal with them. And one of the final things that he found that many people didn't think affected health was finding a sense of purpose. When people find things that are bigger than themselves, 
where it's not just about me anymore, it's about other people, they seem to do better. They take care of themselves and they take care of each other and they tend to do better. They tend to eat better and sleep better because they want to be around. And the Japanese call this their ikigai. They find their sense of purpose and passion. So when you find that the forest is on fire, I'm going to encourage you, whether it's your health, your finances, what's going on around you, your business, the coronavirus, whatever forest is on fire, my encouragement to you is just do the best that you can. Just one drop at a time, one lifestyle change at a time, but do the best that you can. And that's all the universe asks of you.